Well, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to another of our webinar Wednesdays. It's hard to believe it's mid-year, but we've got the mid-year California labor update. Year's half over. Well, good afternoon. I'm Kelly Bearden. I'm the director of the CSU Bakersfield Small Business Development Center. And I'll be introducing Nancy Solis Vargas in a couple of minutes. But before we get to that point, I'd like to welcome those of you that are attending our labor law update and look to tell you a little bit about what's going on at the Small Business Development Center. The SBDC is part of a thousand such centers across the country, all across the country, and they offer pretty much the same types of services, uh, pretty much the consulting and the training that we'll talk about. Our region is the Central California region which is 15 counties from Mono County to the north, to Kern County, the south, over to the east, Inyo County, and then over to the Pacific Ocean. Those 14 counties that make up Central California. So our three counties are Kern, Inyo, and Mono. And today's webinar interaction, we encourage you to please ask questions. All of our attendees today will be muted. At the end, you will be emailed a survey. Please complete that survey as your feedback is vitally important in order for us to provide the best quality webinars and topics that you small businesses want to hear. As a matter of fact, today's topic came to us from a survey that we had. Uh, handouts and other materials will be available. Uh, Nancy will share her handouts with you but please mention it on the survey and we can gladly email you that handout. Okay, some of the webinar tips today. If you're listening or watching on a mobile application, that is possible to actually uh, view this business topic today on a mobile application, such as a phone or a tablet. Uh, you will need to download the Zoom software for the best experience. Sometimes we have polls, we're not gonna have one today. We will have plenty of fun though. And if you submit questions through your questions and answer, we'll try to get through them at the show. If not during today's episode, what we'll do is we will get an answer to you real soon. So what do we do at the SBDC? We provide high quality, no cost, confidential one-on-one -on -one consulting. We also have training programs. We like to use these Wednesday webinars for our small business owners on the go. But there are other things that we do too, as well as seminars. And we have some capital summits coming up for those that are looking for finance information. And we also do more in-depth training and client and other classes. And you can sign up here at the link below to become a client of the SBDC. Our next webinar is going to be the Blueprint for Small Business Success with Tom Weir. And Tom's been a consultant and has been with the SBDC since basically its inception in 2010. It's going to be an excellent uh, uh, webinar. It's going to have some great takeaways and some supplies that you can use in your business, a blueprint for small business success. So that brings us to today's topic, and we're thrilled again to have Nancy Solis Spargus with us. Nancy is a, currently the Human Resource Manager of CENTUS here in Bakersfield. And at CENTUS, she's responsible for a number of functions as the Human Resource Manager. Prior to CENTUS, Nancy worked human relations and management positions at a number of different other places. And most notably, she consulted small business owners in human resource and marketing through the CSUB Small Business Development Center. That's right, Nancy was our very first student intern back in 2012. She has a diverse background experiences, including the marketing and the management, the project management. She's worked exclusively with a number of small businesses and nonprofit organizations and is vital out in the community doing outreach and volunteers her time for a number of different activities, groups, and organizations. Uh, her passion for human resources come from her commitment to helping others find that career path. Nancy, thank you for joining us. It's great to have you here today. Take it away. 
Kelly, thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity and thank you SBDC. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. It's very important for all businesses, including our small businesses, to stay up to date with all the laws and legislations because if they don't do so, it can be very costly and penalties and lawsuits. So thank you for taking the time today um, to educate yourself or get a little refresher on some stuff that's coming up. And um, so today what we're going to cover is we're going to talk about some of the California regulations. We're going to talk about proposed new Fair Employment Housing Council regulations, key court decision in 2018, and proposed legislation that's pending in California that we want to make sure you know just in case any of those get approved and pass this law. So uh, when you're looking to make sure you're, you're up to date on these topics. There's a lot of great resources out there, including the Small Business Development Center. So make sure to check out not only the mid-year, but the beginning of the year, but also look at places like the Department of Industrial uh, Relations. Their website always has all, all the updates. California Chamber, also very important, our, your local chambers, and then SHRM. I recently went to a SHRM you know, session and got some great information. So make sure all, all those small business owners, you know what resources are out there for you. So to, why don't we jump into the number one affects all, whether small, large employers, and that's going to be the California minimum wage. So the California minimum wage, we know that in 2016, our governor uh, signed a bill that will make the minimum wage in California $15 by 2022. And so for large businesses, uh, since January 1st of 2017, they had to make an update and for our small businesses, they received a one-year delay, but they did see that first increase earlier this year in January uh, 1st. Um, and small businesses have until 2023 to reach the $15 per hour rate. Now, when the minimum goes up, and the next slide shows you that schedule that is coming up, and it's definitely going to be affecting you know, all of our, not only small businesses, but large businesses. And you can see the schedule. So coming up in about six months, you need to be ready um, to make that update. So from 10.50 per hour, all of your employees for companies that are fewer than 25 um, employees will need to be $11. And that's big. And just remember that the, that's the California minimum wage, but there are counties and cities that have their own wage ordinances and UC Berkeley Labor Center has a good uh, document that recaps all the cities and counties. So if that's something I used to mention earlier, Kelly, that documents are made available to them. That's one that I could definitely send out. So you're sure that no matter, even if your business is in Kern County, if you're operating in any other county or city in California, you're up to date with what is the minimum wage in that location. So very important. Um, you know, you, I hear questions also about, because there's a distinguishing thing between employers with 26 or more employees and employees with 25 or fewer, what happens if through the year you uh, fall under the 26 and you go in and you're considered maybe on this other small business? Uh, very important, what do you do? So it's very important, um, the labor code and employment contract law require employers to notify workers in advance the terms of their compensation, so every pay period is where you can make a change, but you need to make sure your employees are know in advance. It is always safer to go with the higher um, hourly rate for those employees with 26 or more employees, so that's very important. Um, and when the minimum wage goes up, it impacts a lot of things. It's not just uh, the just the hourly rate. And let's talk about some of those things that are getting impacted when the minimum wage gets um, increases. And we're going to be seeing those increases for the next few years. So first of all, overtime rate, and that's going to be increasing. Overtime is based on the regular rate of pay. And in no case, maybe the regular rate of pay be less than the applicable minimum wage. And as we all know, the, that overtime rate is whatever your regular rate times one and a half. So make sure if you have any employees that are at the minimum wage, as we come into the next year and it goes and it increases, your overtime rates reflect that. Then you, the minimum wage also impacts exempt uh, employees. So 
you will see their salaries increasing and it increases significantly and this um, does impact our businesses. So you, you can see that for employers with 26 or more employees starting in six months, that's minimum salary rate, it's gonna go up to $49,920 or our, our smaller businesses with 25 or fewer employees in six months, you're gonna see the minimum salary rate will be going up to $45,760. And that's going from 43,680 annually. So very important to start preparing um, for that. And for an employee to qualify under the commonly used administrative, executive, or professional exemptions from overtime, the employee must meet the salary basis test, which means employee salary must be no less than two times the state minimum wage for full-time employees. That's very important that you Make sure as the minimum wage increases, you're increasing all the other areas that are impacted. Another thing can be the meals and lodging, the, the minimum amounts you know, change every year. So you have to stay on top of that if you are using any of those rates. So moving on to other uh, compensations that are impacted by the minimum wage if, you're, if you have employees that um, they are required to use their own tools, for example, mechanics, you know, sometimes they have to bring in their tool, own tools. Please make sure that they are being paid at least two times the minimum wage. And I'll always remember that even though they are required to use their own tools, if there's any safety PPE, that's um, items that the company has to provide. So inside salesperson exemption compensation will also increase to meet the exception that the employee must be paid at least one and a half times the minimum wage and over half of the compensation must consist of commissions. We also see piece rate pay and commission paid employees affected by the minimum wage and we have to make sure that they receive at least the minimum wage. So very important. And then a couple more things to mention that impact the minimum wage. You also have the sub-minimum wage. And when we refer to the sub-minimum wage, uh, you know, while the California minimum wage law applies to most all employers, private and public, there are specific exceptions to both the federal and state minimum wage requirements. So California minimum wage laws allow an employer to pay trainees, often referred to as learners, a sub-minimum wage rate that is no less than 85% of the standard minimum wage, and that's for the first 160 hours of employment. So I mentioned this one because as I mentioned, uh, you can't pay anything less than 85% of the standard minimum wage. So as the minimum wage increases, your sub minimum wage will also increase. And then also very important that as the minimum wage increases, the notice requirements, not only the postings that you need to have in your facility, but also um, any new hires need to be provided um, a document that states their not only our hourly rate, overtime rate, and on the uh, PowerPoint you'll see an example. It's one typically used, the Labor Commissioner's template. Most businesses utilize that one, so it's important to make sure those are updated. Um, as you can see here, every time the minimum wage goes up, it's impacting several uh, different pays. So now let's jump into the workplace violence prevention plans that are now mandatory for all California hospitals. So this went into effect um, in April 1st, so a couple months ago. And so this new mandate requires all acute care hospitals and skilled nursing facilities in California to have a comprehensive workplace violence prevention plan. You may even wonder, how did this come about? Well, the California Nurses Association, they strongly push for the mandate as approximately 20% of nurses and nursing students in the U.S. say they have been physically assaulted on the job. So this is a very important uh, new law. And under the mandate, this in, those in charge of hospital safety must assess and identify areas in which employees are vulnerable to violence while at work. Some areas include a review of staffing and staffing patterns and the effectiveness of security systems. Additionally, areas of high security risk, such as entry and exit points for employees during late night and early morning shifts and employee parking lot safety must also be monitored under the mandate 
according to the Health, Employment, and Labor, all employees must undergo annual education and safety training, which must include how to recognize potential violence, strategies to avoid physical harm, and report violent incidents to the employer. Employers must also um, have access to resources for coping with violence, such as critical uh, stress debriefing or employee assistance programs. So that's going to be very important with all the uh, acute care hospitals and skilled nursing facilities in our state. So number two, um, the gender neutral facility signage. So as you know, the existing regulations state that employers shall permit employees to use facilities that correspond to the employee's gender identity or gender expression, regardless of the employee's assigned sex at birth. Employers also and, and other covered entities with single occupancy facilities under their control shall use gender neutral signage for those facilities such as restroom, unisex, gender neutral, all gender restroom. So when this law was passed last year, um, legislators did have to pass a emergency uh, re regulations um, to support some industries that, that couldn't necessarily uh, fulfill uh, what the, the law was requiring. And so there was um, an exemption that will now be expiring on August 14th of this year. So coming up soon, but we hope that it'll continue, but it'll be extended. So uh, what happens now is this subsection does not apply to non-water carriage disposal facilities in those workplaces covered by California code regulations. So this is impacting industries like construction, general industry, agricultural operations. So, um, and by when we, when we speak about non-water carriage disposal facilities like porta potties, um, so however, all other subsections of this of this section apply to such employers. So um, we want to know that you do have some relief until August 14th, and we hope it continues to get extended. So um, this one's a big one for construction and, and, and folks in the agricultural operations. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to another one that on July 1st will become effective. And that's the new Fair Employment Housing Council regulations regarding national origin discrimination. So the new regulations address several things. And those include the definition of national origin, English only and language restrictions, discrimination based on accent, discrimination based on English proficiency, immigration related practices, and retaliation. And so let's jump into um, each of these that I've explained um, to further explain some important information for all of our um, businesses. So we begin first with the national origin discrimination, the definition. And that national origin includes, but is not limited to, the individual's or ancestors' actual or perceived physical, cultural, or linguistic characteristics associated with a national origin group we also have marriage to or association with persons of a national origin group, tribal affiliation, membership in or association with an organization identified with or seeking to promote the interests of a national origin group, attendance or participation in schools, churches, temples, mosques, or other religious institutions generally used by persons of a national origin group, and a name that is associated with a national origin group. So national origins groups includes, but are not limited to ethnic groups, geographic places of origin, and counties that are not presently in existence. Undocumented applicant or employee means an applicant or employee who lacks legal authorization under federal law to be present and or to work in the United States. So let's talk about some of the language restrictions that come with this legislation or this law. It is unlawful employment practice for an employer or other covered entity to adopt or enforce a policy that limits or prohibits the use of language in the workplace, including but not limited to an English only rule, unless the language restriction is justified by business necessity, the language restriction is narrowly tailored, and 
the employer has effectively notified its employees of the circumstances and time when the language restriction is required to be observed and the consequence for violating the language restriction. And when we talk about business necessity, because I know there would be questions about that, for purposes of um, this, business necessity means an overriding legitimate business purpose such that the language restriction is necessary to the safe and efficient operation of the business. The language restriction effectively fulfills the business purpose it is supposed to serve. And there's no alternative practice to the language restriction that would accomplish the business purpose equally well with a lesser discriminatory impact. So it's not sufficient that the employer's language restriction merely promotes business convenience or is due to customer or coworker preference. English only rules violate the act unless the employer can prove the elements listed in section 11028 subdivisions A1, A, and C. English only rules are never lawful during an employee's non-work time, which means their breaks, their lunch, unpaid employer-sponsored events. Now, let's talk about the national origin discrimination based on accent. So employment discrimination based on an applicant's or employee's accent is unlawful unless the employer proves that the individual's accent interferes materially with the applicant's or employee's ability to perform the job in question. Discrimination based on the applicant's or employee's English proficiency is lawful, unlawful, unless the English proficiency requirement at issue is justified by business necessity. For example, the level of proficiency required by the employer is necessary to effectively fulfill the job duties of the position. So in determining business necessity in, in this context, relevant factors include, but are not limited to, the type of proficiency required. For example, um, if it's spoken, written, oral, and or reading comprehension, the degree of proficiency required, and the nature and the job duties of the position. It is not unlawful for an employer to request from an applicant or employee information regarding his or her ability to speak, read, write, or understand any language, including languages other than English, if justified by the business necessities. So retaliation. It is unlawful employment practice for the employer to retaliate against any individual because the individual has opposed discrimination or harassment on the basis of national origin, has participated in the filing of a complaint, or has testified, assisted, or participated in any other manner in a proceeding which national origin discrimination or harassment has been alleged. Retaliation may include, but it's not limited to, threatening to contact or contacting immigration authorities or a law enforcement agency about the immigration status of the employee, former employee, applicant, or family member of the employee, former employee, or applicant, and or taking adverse actions against the employee because the updates or attempts to update personal information based on a change of name, social security number, or government-issued employment document. So, Immigration-related practices. All provisions of the Act and these regulations apply to undocumented applicants and employees to the same extent that they apply to any other applicant or employee. An employee's or applicant's immigration status is irrelevant during the liability phase of any proceeding brought to enforce the Act. So discovery or other inquiry into an applicant or employee's immigration status shall uh, not be permitted unless the person seeking discovery or making inquiry has shown by clear and convincing evidence that such inquiry is necessary to comply with the federal immigration law. It is unlawful practice for an employer or other covered entity to discriminate against an employee because of the employee's or applicant's immigration status unless the employer has shown by clear or convincing evidence that it is required to do so in order to comply with federal immigration law. And it is also a lawful practice for an employer or other covered entity to retaliate as described in subdivision E against an employee for engaging in activity protected by the act. And now the last one we will cover is the height and or weight requirements that are protected 
by the national origin discrimination um, law. So such requirements, height and weight, may have the effect of creating a desperate uh, impact on the basis of national origin. Where an adverse impact is established, such requirements are unlawful unless the employer can demonstrate that they are job related and justified by business necessity. Where such a requirement is job related and justified by business necessity, it is still unlawful if the applicant or employee can prove that the purpose of the requirement can be achieved as effectively through less discriminatory means. So, some of the more common discrimination claims, you know, they can involve ethnic slurs or other offensive conduct, denial or job offers or promotions, unequal pay or more severe treatment and discipline and, and termination. So please make sure to become familiar with this law. As I mentioned, it, July 1st is the effective date. Now let's jump into some proposed new Fair Employment Housing Council regulations. So these are legislations that are already in existence but there was a need to make some modifications or updates. And right now, all of these are still uh, being proposed, so they're not final. So we begin with the parental leave for small employers. Uh, so this is Senate Bill 63. The new Parent Leave Act expands such protection to smaller employees, and the NPLA requires that employers with 20 more employees provide the following that they provide up to 12 weeks of unpaid job protected parental leave, and that's leave to them with a new child within one year of the child's birth, adoption, or foster care placement. To employees who request such leave, the employee has more than 12 months of service, at least 1,250 hours of service during the previous 12 month period, and works at a work site in which the employer employs at least 20 employees within a 75 mile. So also they need to maintain group health plan coverage for such an employee during the parental leave. The employer may recover costs if the employee fails to return from leave and the failure is for a reason other than a continuation, reoccurrence, or onset of a serious health condition or other circumstances beyond the control of that employee. Also on or before the commencement of the leave, it's important to provide the employee with a guarantee of employment in the same or a comparable position upon the termination of a leave. And you must allow the employee to use accrued vacation, sick time, paid sick time, or other accrued paid time off, or other paid or unpaid time off negotiated with the employer during the leave. The MPLA also prohibits discrimination, retaliation, and interference related to rights under the act. So, for the most part, the proposed regulations that are being proposed simply incorporate references to the NPLA into the existing CFRA regulations. However, there are a few important areas in which the uh, Federal Employment Housing Council proposes to distinguish the NPLA. So it's very important to understand kind of what are those propositions uh, so you can be ready if they do get uh, our pass. So they say that this is necessary to identify differences between the CIFRA and the NPLA. So namely jurisdiction differences and the latter's lack of key employee defense and the lack of provision allowing employers to mandate the use of vacation time or other accrued paid time off vacation. So there's no key employee defense under the current NPLA. So under the CIFRA, an employer may refuse to reinstate certain key employees to the same position or a comparable position following C for leave. Certain conditions are met. However, uh, the current NPLA contain no statutory language providing for a similar key employee exemption. So the, F, uh, the FEHC interprets this to mean that there is no similar key employee defense to reinstate under the MPLA. So therefore, it proposes to add language to include the key employee. Um, so that's going to be one thing that they're wanting to include. And then the other thing is, um, employer may not force the use of the paid accrued time off under MPLA. So the CFRA regulations provide that an employee may elect to use, or an employer may require 
an employee to use any accrued vacation time or other paid accrued time off, including undifferentiated paid time off that the employee is eligible to take during the otherwise unpaid portion of the C for leave. So again, because the SB uh, 63 does not specifically mention the ability of an employer to do so in the context of the NPLA, that um, FEHC interprets this to be constitute a significant distinction between uh, CIFRA and the NPLA. Therefore, the proposed regulations would expressively state an employer does not have the right to require an employee to use accrued paid time off during an otherwise unpaid portion of the NPLA leave, though an employee may elect to do so. So that's um, some important changes that are being proposed. Now we're going to move on to another uh, another slide, which is the ban the box. So there are some notice requirement clarifications that are being um, proposed. So last year, the uh, Federal Employment Housing Council they adopted regulations related to the use of criminal convention, conviction history and employment. So among other things, these regulations set forth a legal theory of adverse impact and its relationship to the Fair Employment and Housing Act and criminal conviction history. So these, these regulations became in effect July 1st of 2017. So that was last year. Um, however, following the enactment of the ban of the box along, it became necessary for the Federal Employment Housing Committee or Council to amend these regulations to incorporate the provisions of the new law into the existing regulatory scheme. So for the most part, the proposed regulations track the statutory language of AB 1008. However, in two important areas, the proposal seeks to clarify the regulations by addressing issues not specifically contained in AB 1008. So for, uh, starting off with the calculation of the five business days requirement for applicant response. So there was a confusion as to what did it mean five, um, the five days, and that's important. So, if an employer decides to revoke a conditional offer of employment after reviewing criminal conviction history, it is required to notify the applicant in writing and provide them at least five business days to respond. In order to avoid disputes over the meaning of the statute's potentially ambiguous use of five business days, the FEHC proposes to specify that the five business days is calculated from the date of receipt of a notice by the applicant. The proposed regulations also have the following language. If notice is transmitted through a format that does not provide a confirmation of receipt, such as a written notice mailed by an employer without tracking delivery enabled, the notice shall be deemed received five calendar days after the mailing is deposited for delivery for California addresses and then it gives an extension if it's outside of California or even outside of the United States. So uh, that's also very important. So AB uh, 1008 also provides the applicant's response to a revocation of conditional offer of employment may include evidence of rehabilitation and mitigating circumstances or both. So the types of evidence that may demonstrate rehabilitation or mitigating circumstances may include, but is not limited to, the length and consistency of employment history before and after the offense or conduct, the facts or circumstances surrounding the offense or conduct, and rehabilitation efforts such as education and training. So um, it should be noted this is not an exclusive or exhaustive list. So these are some of the proposed changes that only seek to clarify not only this um, legislation and law, but the one before that we just spoke about. So we'll stay tuned to see if these do um, get passed. Now there's also some key court decisions that have already occurred in 2018. And so there's a lot um, that have, that are, that are considered key court decisions. So I'm gonna list um, a few that would be important if this specific court case is related to your industry or you feel it might um, impact your business, I would encourage you to get further information. I just want to make sure you know these are the, some of the key court decisions that we've had already in this year. So we begin first with Encino Motor Cars versus Navarro. And this is regarding uh, service advisors in the auto industry are exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act. There have been companies that 
I've wanted to, or not companies, but employees who feel that that's not the case. We've also had the Dynamics versus Los Angeles Superior Court, where there is significant change to independent contractor and employee tests. And I do want to take a minute to further explain this one, because this might impact a lot more um, businesses. So it's very, it's important to be very careful about characterizing a worker as an independent contractor. The California Supreme Court issued a decision that could make it substantially more difficult for businesses in California to show that their workers are independent contractors rather than employees. The court has adopted a new version of the so-called ABC test for purposes of claims brought under California's Industrial Welfare Commission wage orders. So under this test, a worker is independent contractor rather than employee only if he or she meets the following three factors. And those are our, first, the worker is free from the control and direction of their uh, employer in connection with the performance of the work, both under the contract for the performance of the work, and in fact, and the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity business, and the worker is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as that involved in the work performed. And I'll continue on listing and sharing with you other court decisions. Then we had also Curry versus Echelon, and this is the dynamics test does not apply to joint employer analysis. We also saw the Epic System Corp versus Lewis, and this is regarding mandatory arbitration agreements, and they are enforceable. We saw the Duran versus the U.S. Bank National Association, and this was class certification was properly denied in the outside sales exemption case. A couple more key court decisions that I want to make sure you take note of is the uh, Canvas is done at Words Court, and this is plaintiffs in PAGA claim must identify other aggrieved employees. The Perez versus City of Roosevelt, adverse employment action against police officer for off duty extramarital relations that did not impact job performance was unconstitutional. That's right, it was unconstitutional. I don't know why that hot word, I just couldn't say. Yeah, it's a great word, unconstitutional. <laughs> so moving on to the Bel Air Internet, uh, LLC versus Morales which is um, about urging other employees to quit and sue employer is protected under anti-SLAPP statute. And then the Maldonado versus Epsilon Plastics company failed to follow alternative work week schedule rules and pay stuff. So um, we do have a lot of companies and businesses that like to follow an alternative work week schedule. So it's very important to um, when implementing it, to be very cautious of how you do it and making sure you go through the full process so you uh, won't find yourself um, in potential troubles or lawsuits. So those are some of those regulation or key court decisions that have already happened in 2018. Now let's talk about some proposed legislation that is pending in California. And although these have not passed, they're getting proposed, it's important to know now, know now because you need to prepare for them or make sure um, in the future you follow up and check into that these become law. So let's go over them. And there, there's definitely a lot of proposed legislation coming up. And we begin first with AB 1565 that proposes modification to new law making direct contractor potentially liable for subcontractor non-compliance. Assembly Bill 1867, this bill would require an employer with 50 or more employees to maintain records of employee complaints of sexual harassment for 10 years from the date of filing. Assembly Bill 187, this bill would extend the statute of limitations for claims alleging violations of the Fair Employment and Housing Act from one year to three years. Assembly Bill 1976, this bill would establish a new mandate regarding lactation accommodations whereby the employer must make a reasonable effort to provide a location other than a bathroom for the employee to express breast milk. And then Senate Bill 937, this bill would require further lactation accommodation including specifications of the room designated for lactation. Assembly Bill 
2,455, this bill would require the state to turn over personal information of registered home care aides to unions for the purpose of organizing. And we have a few more. Assembly Bill 26113, this bill imposes another layer of labor code penalties for wage and hour violations in addition to the penalties already available under the Private Attorneys General Act and imposes personal liability onto employees who have no control over the actual payment of wages. Assembly Bill 2770, this bill would include among those privileged communication complaints of sexual harassment by an employee without malice to an employer based on credible evidence and communication between the employer and the interested persons regarding a complaint of sexual harassment and would authorize an employer to answer without malice whether the employer would rehire an employee and whether or not a decision to not rehire is based on the employer's determination that the former employee engaged in sexual harassment. Assembly Bill 2946, this bill proposes extending the statute of limitations for labor code retaliation claims from six months to three years. Assembly Bill 3081, this bill would extend these protections to an employee who takes time off to assist a family member as defined who is a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, and now including sexual harassment or stalking. And then we have Senate Bill 1284. This bill would require private employers that have a hundred or more employees to submit a pay data report to the Department of Industrial Relations. So, so those are some of the legislation that is being proposed and we need to keep an eye out to see if they become law. So we were able to cover, you know, the updates that are coming up uh, for the latter part of 2018. Got to see a listing of those court cases that are very notable for 2018 and then proposed le legislation that's coming out. Definitely in the beginning of the year, you have a lot more laws that take place. Uh, but it's important even mid-year to ch check out what's, what's going on here in California when it comes to labor laws. Now we, that takes us to the end where we have time for questions. And Nancy, we do have time for some questions. But boy, first a comment. Cripe legislators and courthouse employees take a day off for crying out loud. Yes, please. It's hard to believe all that legislation and all those court rulings in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, kind of scroll through these questions and uh, see what we have here. I hope we have time to get to everybody's question. Uh, question number one, can a commission income pay period be used to cover shortfall in an earlier pay period? So, great question. Thanks for asking that. So, employees must be paid at least the minimum wage in every pay period, even if the commissions they have earned that period fall below that amount. So it's very important. Every pay period, you must make sure your commissioned employees are making at least the minimum wage. So I pay an employee minimum wage, or I, I pay them commissions, but if they don't make enough commissions for that pay period, I still have to pay a minimum wage. You do. Okay, you got to make sure. Boy, not much incentive there. Is there? <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Our second question is travel about travel time. And many, many uh, employees, they travel to and from a job site, construction and others. And the question is, travel time must also be paid at the minimum wage rate. So, great question. So, because traveling does not require an, the employee to employ his or her skills, pay for travel time can be at a rate of pay less than the employee's normal rate of pay. So, you can pay the employee as little as the minimum wage for travel pay, but it can never be less than the minimum wage. Great. Oh, here's an easy question I can answer. Earlier in your presentation, Nancy, you talked about SHRM. Yes. Now, what is SHRM? And let me answer by saying SHRM is not short for Sherman. Is that correct? <laughs> no. So SHRM is the Society for Human Resource Management. And we have a local chapter in, in, in Kern County. And then there's also um, California or a United States-wide chapter. Um, organization. So 
So that's SHRM for you. SHRM here in Kern County, a lot of good resource management professionals. Great. Well, here's another question for you, Nancy. What is the difference between an exempt and a non-exempt employee? Great question. So asking what's the difference between an exempt and non-exempt employee. So an exempt employee has to be paid twice the minimum wage and in uh, a non-exempt employee, they can be paid uh, minimum the minimum wage. Fantastic. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions here. Or maybe I'm not scrolling down far enough, but if your question did not get answered, please, we will reply to it by email. Nancy had a few other of these uh, references that she wanted to mention. Yeah, like I mentioned in the beginning, places where, where you should go if you have questions. I mean, definitely consult with your own attorney, but if you want to um, search other places, the Department of Industrial Relations is a great website. Um, Cal Chamber, uh, SHRM, um, and definitely, like I said, SHRM, there's uh, SHRM chapters in most of the uh, counties or big cities. So those are some places to check out updates in labor law. Great, and these were all great references and resources for today's presentation. So I think that about wraps us up to today, for today. We'll be back on July 11th for another webinar on the blueprint of small business success with Tom Weir. For Nancy Salise Vargas, I'm Kelly Bearden, wishing you a very happy day. Everybody have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye now.